Welcome, everyone, and happy Thursday. I'd like to welcome you to Data Source Consulting's educational webinar series. This is Deborah Langer, Vice President of Business Development for Data Source Consulting, and you are about to learn about how to implement data quality. As many of you know, um, data quality is becoming more and more important in today's enterprise business world, especially as companies look to leverage the full potential of their data. The negative impacts of dirty data can be minor from time lost doing manual cross checks to having devastating implications such as exposure to unnecessary risks or even loss of millions of dollars. Uh, well established data quality programs, they're really long term. They just don't address data quality issues of today but prevent data quality from being a concern in the future. A proactive approach enables trust and better collaboration between both business and IT. Not only that, but high data quality can also feed into the success of more comprehensive efforts, such as data governance or MDM. So this presentation will help to identify some of the best profiling, data profiling tips, and data quality rules, as well as provide some real world examples. The webinar is quick, it's concise, and it's to the point so that you will quickly know if data quality is an area that you should be giving additional consideration. Uh, we're going to get started here in just a moment. Um, quickly, let me introduce Data Source Consulting to provide you some background on our expertise in this area. Data Source Consulting established in 2005. We've been serving Fortune 500 and mid-sized companies alike providing services for data integration, enterprise data management, and business intelligence work. Data Source Consulting provides both strategic services as well as implementation services, um, but all are centered around data architecture, data warehousing, data modeling, ETL work, data virtualization, and growing needs towards data governance, data quality, and of course MDM. We typically engage doing project-based work, but we also work in a hybrid model, providing supplemental expertise to internal teams. And uh, we try and focus not just on what we're delivering, but also how we're delivering that. And we do that by sharing methodologies, processes, and best practices. And this alignment of the what and the how um, this approach can really lead to some very effective differentiators in the marketplace for some of our clients. Uh, we are also part of the Data Warehouse Institute as board members and faculty instructors. We are regular contributors to the BI scorecard, and we have published articles in leading publications such as Information Management. And actually, right now, we've got um, on our homepage a great white paper, um, in case any of you are interested, um, that was published in Information Management. And it is on the top 10 business intelligence trends for 2014. So if that's something that you're interested in, you can uh, go check that out on our website. Uh, some quick logistics. We have everyone muted. At the end of the presentation, we've reserved some time for more formal Q&A which will be done through the chat. The presentation is 30 minutes in length with 10 minutes reserved for questioning. So you know, by all means, please ask questions. I think that's where we really get to the good conversation and can really get some good value out of this. Uh, we will also have our contact information on the last slide in case um, you would prefer to engage with us that way. So feel free to do it. Uh, let's get going. Um, I'd like to introduce you all to our presenter. Sally McCormick has over 10 years of data integration, data warehousing, and business intelligence expertise. She is an expert level data integration developer and administrator with experience in both architecting and implementing ETL and data quality solutions. Her experience includes full lifecycle development from requirements, gathering all the way through to the maintenance phase. Sally is Certified Business Intelligence Professional in Data Integration and Data Analysis and Design. And she is also an Informatica Certified Professional in Power Center Data Integration and also um, Informatica Data Quality. So at this point, let me go ahead and turn it over to Sally. Thank you, Deborah. 
In today's webinar, we're going to be discussing the importance of data quality, and we'll learn how to effectively implement a successful data quality management process. We'll dive down into each phase of the process, including data profiling, rule definition, design, implementation, and monitoring. So why is data quality important? You know, one of the biggest reasons why we need to ensure our data is good or accurate is due to the cost of having bad data. Let's look at a recent example in the news. General Motors recently recalled 2.6 million of its vehicles. Uh, they sent out recall notices to everyone who may be affected. This actually included families of those who actually lost a loved one due to the faulty emission switch. GM knew of these 13 families and they could have easily remove them from their distribution. If they had better data quality, they would have known not to send these letters to these families, but instead they're now having to send another apology and spend more time and money in trying to improve their already negative company image. Let's look at another example. Recently, Vodafone customers received a message thanking them for their payment. Now, that would have been great. However, the customers were not expecting to actually make a payment to their Vodafone account. This definitely caused distress with the customers of, of Vodafone. I know that if I was a Vodafone customer, I'd likely be looking for another provider. You know, Vodafone has had numerous billing errors lately, and if they had better data quality, they wouldn't have to continually deal with these errors and potentially lose customers. Instead, they'd be using their data as an asset. Now, having bad data can be costly. According to TBWI, the cost of bad data is more than $600 billion annually in the United States. You know, looking back at our examples of General Motors and Vodafone, the potential consequences of having low data quality include a negative company image and low customer satisfaction and a loss of customers. Other potential consequences include missed opportunities, misguided business decisions, financial inaccuracies, and legal penalties. You know, think about the large companies that have had recent data breaches. A number of these potential consequences of low data quality are things that those companies actually have to face now. So let's look at an example in more detail. Here's a list of potential customers that we want to contact for a promotion. What's wrong with this list? Well, you can see that they're invalid addresses. 834 2nd Avenue Street, is that really the street name? Probably not. You can see West Hill Lane is missing a house number. There's also missing data. We don't have phone numbers for everybody. We don't have email addresses for anybody. And we don't have certain address elements. We won't be able to reach these customers for our promotion if we don't have their complete mailing address and their email. We also see that we have potentially duplicate contacts. There's three John Smiths. Which one is the right one? If we have duplicate contacts, we could be mailing that same John Smith multiple mailers and spending extra money when we don't need to. And we also see data that's in a non-standard format. And you can see that there's a California value in what appears to be a city field in Adder 2. And we see a postal code where it should be a state. Uh, having an inconsistent non-standard format doesn't allow us to automate the process. From these examples, we see the potential consequences of low data quality. We see missed opportunities, misguided business decisions, a low customer satisfaction, and a negative company image. I know if I received a mailer with an incorrect spelling of my name or even the wrong name, I'd disregard that mailer toss it in the junk mail and recycle it. I would not do business with that company. Let's take a look at another example. We can see here that there are five contacts. What are the potential matches of duplicates? Well, you can see that there's five records, and the first John Smith can likely be matched with the second John Smith and the third John Smith. Maybe it could be matched with that Bob Johnson if you're looking at the name John. Or you can look at Sarah Smith. Maybe Smith is a match. Well, looking at those five records, you can potentially have 10 different pairs. Not just five records. If you were to look at 500 records, you could have potentially 124,750 pairs. 
Now, if you think about 5,000 records, imagine that you can have up to 12.5 million pairs. Now, how did I come up with that number? I used the equation n squared, where n is the number of records, minus n divided by 2. So if you take the five records, 5 times 5 is 25, minus 5 is 20, divided by 2, it gives you 10 potential pairs. Now, we don't want to have to actually match all of these records together. So how do we do that? We actually need to group the records together based off of whether or not you know, the contact value is the same or the address. It really depends on what you're trying to match here. And the grouping of the records can take a long time. You want to make sure that you have the right amount of records in order to effectively match and merge the records. If your data set is too large, you may be spending a lot of time in trying to match records that really shouldn't be matched. If it's too small, then you won't have any matches at all. As part of the matching process, you'll need to create and leverage algorithms to determine which records truly do match together. John Smith, without the H, and John Smith with the H are likely duplicates. But maybe John Smith without the H and John Smith underneath it is not a duplicate. So we need to use algorithms such as edit distance, jar distance, bigram, or hamming to correctly match the records and then proceed with merging. So now that we know why data quality is important, let's look at when we would implement it. We'd implement data quality when there's a business need, when we need to solve a business problem. And one of the reasons why we'd also want to implement is when we want to use our data as a strategic asset. So I'll give you an example. Think about any social network, Facebook, for example. You know, on Facebook, you can update your status, you can include a hashtag, check into a location, upload photos, you know, like company pages, all of that. And I'll give you my example from this past weekend. I attended a bar class at a hotel. And by bar, I mean B-A-R-R-E, a fitness class, not a, a bar class. That would be great, but not at 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, so I attended this class. I took a photo of the coastline, and I tagged the hotel and the bar studio. Later that night, I also went to a baseball game. I took a photo of the stadium, the giveaways, and I took a picture of the game. I tagged the stadium and updated my status, including in the hashtag. Now, if I were Facebook, I would look at my information and I'd be able to target specific ads to you know, somebody who likes fitness activities and somebody who likes sports. They could easily take all that data and target ads in my location. Now, another reason when you'd want to implement data quality is when you have a list of non-compliance. A lot of companies today have a lot of regulations that they need to meet or they have validated systems where they have to follow Sarbanes-Oxley. And certain healthcare organizations have the need to follow HIPAA and the Sunshine Act. So if a company is you know, needing to be audited, they want to make sure that, that their data is found and accurate. So that's when data quality is important to implement. Another reason or another time when you'd actually want to implement data quality is when you have disparate data sources. Think about pulling all your data sources and pulling that information into a data warehouse. You know, if your data is coming from different locations and different formats, it would be very difficult to effectively report on that data if it's not standardized. We also need to implement data quality when we have master data management. The most basic example is a customer master. We can have customers input into multiple source systems. And you know, going back to our previous example of duplicates, how do we know which customer is the right one? With data quality, we'd be able to standardize the customers and then match and merge appropriately. Another example is when there are mergers and acquisitions. A lot of companies will purchase a competing company and they'll take over the sales of that competing product. They may want to have the sales data from previously and also trend that with the sales data that they have now. So in order to have that data all together and report on it effectively, they'll need to make sure that the data is in a standardized format. 
Also, you can consider implementing data quality when you're implementing a new system. You know, the saying comes to mind, garbage in and garbage out, right? So if you're implementing a new system, it's the perfect time to implement data quality to make sure that your data is cleansed so that you can make the right decisions and report on it effectively. And also, you can use data quality when you're performing a system migration. You know, a lot of companies today are migrating their CRM or ERP systems. Many of them are going up to the cloud. And often, the legacy systems aren't the same format as the new system. So that's when data quality comes into play, when you need to cleanse the data prior to migrating it. So now that we know, you know why data quality is important and when we should implement it, let's look at how. We do that by following the data quality management process. This process is used to measure and improve the quality of important data on an ongoing basis. And with the data quality management process, you need to ensure that the right people are involved. You have a data steward who acts as the person who knows the data and profiles the data to see what the data anomalies are. That same data steward will then define the rules that need to be applied to cleanse the data, to standardize it, to validate it. And we'll give that to the developer who in turn will design the data quality rules and also the overall improvement process. They'll then work together to collaborate and implement the process. And finally, the data steward will monitor the data. And this process is an iterative process. You know, initial rules that are defined by the data steward may change. As your data changes, you may, you may realize that, oh, this rule doesn't make sense anymore. It no, it's no longer sufficient for this business need. And there are certain questions that you should ask during the data quality management process to ensure that it's a continuous cycle. You know, ask, is the data quality improving over time? If it isn't, do I need to update my rules? You know, are these rules meeting the needs of the company right now? So let's look at the first step of the data quality management process, data profiling. This is performed by the data steward. And this is where the data steward will identify and measure data quality to look for the data anomaly. They'll ask, how good is the data right now? Or how bad is the data? Can this data be used for other purposes? Now, it's important to understand the issues and anomalies to lay the foundation for these business rules and processes that will be put in place as part of the data quality management process. During profiling, there are six data quality dimensions that should be followed. With completeness, you can see what data is missing. Well, here we can see there are certain address elements that are missing. Conformity. What data is in a non standard format? We can see the phone numbers in varying formats. And with consistency, you see that we have two transaction records with different customer IDs. We know that that isn't correct. With accuracy, what values are valid? You can see that West Hill Lane is likely an invalid address because it does not have a number. The duplicates, which John Smith is the right one? And finally, integrity. You can see that the customer ID is missing. Now, data profiling can be done in various tools. You can do it manually using SQL. You can use Excel. There are a number of tools out there. But I'll be leveraging Informatica Data Quality, or IDQ as I'll abbreviate it, to show how effective it can be in using a tool to profile the data. So in this example, we'll go back to our customer data. We're going to look at adder2, and we can see here that there are only seven unique values. There's four null values. Not sure if that's right or not. We can look at the values of the data and see, well, there's one record that's SD, one record that is San Diego all caps, and one record that is San Diego mixed case. It's likely that SD and San Diego all caps and San Diego mixed case could be the same value. We can also take a look at the phone number. Here we can see the patterns of the data. So we can see that the data is formatted with all numbers. There's two records that have all numbers. There's three records that have hyphens, and there's six that are null. When you're looking at the data, you can also see the values and see the statistics of it. 
you see that there's a go and stop and a stop and go. Now, is that the same company? Potentially. If so, we'll need to figure out how to cleanse that to make it stop and go versus go and stop. Now, when you're profiling your data, consider the data quality dimension of completeness, accuracy, conformity, etc. But also consider timeliness. If you're expecting your data to be loaded on a weekly basis, is your data showing that it is actually being loaded in a weekly, on a weekly basis? Make sure they document that. Also, profile production data. You want to ensure that the appropriate rules are defined as you're profiling. So make sure that you're looking at production data versus test data, where you could be defining a rule that really isn't necessary. Now, unless you have a large data set where you have billions of records, I would recommend profiling all of your data. This will allow you to look at all the data and ensure that you capture all the potential data anomalies. You should also profile column level initially. This will help you determine what columns you should include as part of the process. So for example, you may think that column XYZ is really important, but you notice that there are no values in it when you're profiling. Now that may indicate that there's a larger data quality issue, or you're just looking at the wrong column. And profile often. Your data can change as often as you can insert or update the data, right? So make sure that you profile often to capture all the potential inaccuracies and anomalies. Make sure that when you're profiling that you document the results. Now this will help you prioritize as you move into the next phase of the process. And finally, use software like Informatica Data Quality for faster analysis. If you're profiling a handful of records, it may be easy to use SQL. However, if you are looking at millions of records, a tool will definitely speed up that process. Now the next step of the process after profiling is defining the rule. This is done by the data steward, and it's part of the analysis phase. During this part of the process, you want to make sure that you consider what your data quality target is and not your source. And what I mean by that is, let's say your source allows special characters, but your target, let's say you're migrating your data, doesn't allow special characters. You want to make sure that you create a manipulation rule to handle those special characters. And in conjunction with the manipulation rule, you want to consider a validation rule. With the manipulation rule, you could be formatting your data so that it's an uppercase. And then you could then be validating that data against a list of values. And also, consider what metrics you may include for scorecarding when you're defining the rule. So let's look at an example in IDQ as to how a data steward would define their rules. Well, looking at the data, you know, they can see that out of two, there's SD, San Diego, all caps, and San Diego mixed case, and there are null values. They can easily put a comment in the tool to say that null values are not valid and to add a rule to standardize this data. In IDQ, they can also tag the field and say, I want to standardize this data. The developer will actually see the comment and the tag in the developer tool and will have a jump start in actually designing the rule. A data steward can also look at the values and determine what are my valid list of values. And they can add that to a reference table in IDQ. As you can see here, we have San Diego and SD. So if the value SD shows up, San Diego will be returned. If LA shows up, Los Angeles will be returned. Now, some tips when you're defining rules. Make sure that you define rules that solve business data issues. Don't just define rules just because you want to have a bunch of rules. It should have a purpose. Also, when you're defining rules, make sure you define manipulation rules that cleanse and standardize the data. These can be as simple as trimming the data or uppercasing the values. Also, define validation rules with the manipulation rules in mind. You know, a validation rule could be, is this address valid? 
Well, we need to make sure that we cleanse the address record first. You know, if we see 123 Main Street, maybe it should be 123 Main ST. As you're defining the rules, make sure you prioritize the rules. You know, a developer may not have the time or bandwidth to deploy all the rules that the data steward wants. So if you're able to prioritize, we can have quick wins in implementing maybe 10 rules at a time. Also, when you're defining the rules, make sure that you educate the data stewards that data that rule chains are going to be constant. And it's an iterative process, so as new data comes in, the same rule that we designed earlier may not be sufficient anymore. Also, use software to enhance collaboration between the data steward and the developer, as we saw with IDQ. And consider a reference table for a valid list of values. You know, let's say you have a chart of accounts. You can easily put that in a reference table rather than hard coding that. Now let's move on to the next step of the data quality management process. This part of the process is the design where the developer will take the business rules that were defined by the data steward and convert them into data quality reusable rules. You know, the developer has a jump start because of the collaboration to and within the IDQ tool. And the, the developer can build on top of what the data steward has already defined. And during this process, the developer should look at implementing the validation and manipulation rules together. And you can see some of the examples here of validating addresses, standardizing names, removing noise. So how would we go about designing this rule? So, you can see from our example before with adder2, where we have an SD value, San Diego all caps, and San Diego mixed case. Well, the data steward said initially that they want to uppercase the value. So we can do that by applying a rule uppercase. So now we can see that there's only SD and San Diego all caps. The data steward also said that they wanted to standardize the value. So we can apply a rule called standardized city using the reference table. And now we can see that we have San Diego. We no longer have an SD value. The data steward also said that null values are invalid. So we can apply the rule completeness and see that which records are null and not null, incomplete being null. Here, we can actually apply all of those rules together in one big rule. So I've applied the rule uppercase, the rule of standardized city, which is looking up to our reference table, and rule completeness. And the output of that will tell the data steward whether or not that value is valid or invalid. You can see I've applied that one rule in the profile, and the data steward can now drill down on the invalid records and to determine what to do with those invalid records. Maybe they need to update it in the source, or maybe it's a contact that's no longer valid and they can deactivate that contact. You can also apply that rule within a logical data object in IDQ. And a logical data object is just a virtual mapping. And I'll go into more details in that in the next slide. So what are some of the design tips in Informatica? Well, make sure that you follow development naming and coding standards. In IDQ, the same rules are seen in both the, by the data steward and by the developer. So you want to make sure that you name it as a rule underscore versus maplet underscore, because the data steward won't understand what a maplet is. Also, make sure that you have a description. The data steward can actually see this description in the tool, so it can be helpful when they are profiling the data and looking at the rules to see if those need to be refined. Also, Consider the environment that you're going to be developing in. Is it data quality or power center? You'd want to use power center for reliability and scalability, improved performance, or if it's part of an ETL process. Make sure you design for reuse. You want to design rules that can be used across data domains and across verticals. For example, rule uppercase can be used anywhere. Rule trim blank spaces can be used anywhere. Make sure those are all in one shared location. Also, consider creating multiple maplets rather than one complex mapping. As you saw from my example earlier, I have the standardized city rule, the rule uppercase, and rule completeness. Those are all separate maplets, and I just pulled it all into one 
mapping to show that you can reuse those objects and it's much easier to read. Also consider using pre-built content from any software tool that you use. So with Informatica, they come with accelerators that include data dictionaries, uh, content sense, and already some pre-built maplets where you can leverage that to perform general data cleansing. Also, use logical data objects, or LDOs. LDOs are virtual mappings where you can actually join data together, join multiple tables, filter out records, rename columns so that you don't need to do that in your actual physical data object. And consider using reference tables. You can throw the list of valid values in a reference table and it's managed by the data steward. The next part of the process is implementation. This is where the data steward and developer collaborate. And the collaboration is very important here and it's constant. The processes during the are the implementation are automated. The data steward and developer work together to figure out what to do with the exception records and what to do with matching and merging records. Now, during exception management, records are flagged by the data quality management process. And here, the data steward will need to ask, do I need to update this record in the source system? Or does the rule need to be updated? Or maybe there's a new value in the data and it should be part of the reference table. Or maybe the exception is valid. As part of this step of the process, we also match and merge, match and merge of the records. As mentioned earlier, we need to make sure that we cleanse the data first before we move on to this process. And that's why the matching and merging is done during the implementation phase rather than the design phase. Here, we need to make sure that we group the records appropriately. Again, we don't want too large of a data set to match by and too small of a data set. We need to make sure that we use matching algorithms and test out all of those matching algorithms. It really depends on what your data is to determine what matching algorithm is appropriate. And since we should test out all the matching algorithms, that's going to take a lot of time. Make sure that you allocate enough time for design, development, and testing of this process. You also want to make sure you have enough time as if you decide to match and merge the records programmatically, that can be much more cumbersome in trying to figure out what's appropriate algorithm to use it. Now, the next step of the process is monitoring. The data steward monitors the data and looks at how well the data quality is for that particular field. But what are the trends? Here, the data steward will determine if the rules need to be updated or new rules need to be created. The developer will work with the data steward to create scorecards with metrics and will also automate notifications. Now, what's a scorecard? A scorecard is a graphical representation of valid values for a column. Now, you can share a scorecard with a stakeholder or upper management, and often you can create a scorecard initially before you apply the data quality rules so that you can show the business that we need to do something and we need to implement a data quality process. Here's an example of a scorecard. You can see here that I have grouped the data quality mentions of accuracy and completeness. And you can see with accuracy and accurate email, complete zip and complete state, how well the data is doing. You can see the trend if it's either going up or down or if it's constant. And also you can see the invalid records. Now some tips when you're monitoring the data. You want to make sure that you create scorecards at the beginning before applying any rules so that you can effectively measure the data quality. You can apply weighting to make sure that there's a weighted score and that will allow you to talk to management and say, you can see 20% of the data was bad before we implemented data quality, now it's 90% good. Also determine the audience for the scorecard. Now, if you're giving the scorecard to upper management, they may only be interested in looking at the trends. But if you're going to be giving the scorecard to somebody who's actually using the data, they'll need the details. So they may need an additional report. So consider what other types of reports might be required to use in addition to a scorecard. 
Now that takes us back to the first step of the process, profiling the data. You know, less time will be spent as the quality of the data improves, but collaboration between the business and IT is constant. And following the data quality management process allows you to show the business results, especially the stakeholders who want to know what problems are we solving, what business problems are we solving with this data quality process. With this approach, both the business and IT, they'll gain greater confidence in the data and it will result in the data usage as a competitive advantage. Now, at this time, I'd like to pass it back over to Deborah for questions. Great, thanks, Dolly. Yes, um, I want to encourage um, all of our listeners to go ahead and utilize the chat if they have questions for Sally. Um, we have had a couple of them come in already, so um, let me get started here. Uh, first question, Sally, when should someone consider a data quality project for their company? I think they should consider a data quality project when there's a business need. So you need to look at your data and see what business problem are we trying to solve. Uh, I'd say don't do data quality just for the sake of doing data quality because really often companies don't have the budget or the resources or the time to implement a data quality project. So you can get more buy-in if there is a true business need for it. Okay, great, very good. And uh, one of the other questions um, that has come up is, and I actually thought of this question too as I was watching, is um, with the, the cycle of you know the whole process, how many, in your experience, how many cycles do you think that it typically takes to really hone in on high quality data? I mean, it would really depend on how bad your data is, honestly, um, and how often your data changes. So, like how, say, how often you're loading it? Yes, exactly. So depending on how often somebody can actually update a customer record, for example, or you know, if you're getting a monthly data set of, for example, prescription data and you get um, prescriber data with it, right? So if you're doing that monthly, then you, know, you may have to go through the cycle a few times to understand the data. But if you're updating data daily, then the cycle can be almost every day. Got it. Okay, very good. And um, how often should the data be profiled? I'd say as often as the data changes. I know that you know the data may change daily. So for some businesses, it also depends on what your threshold is. Maybe 90% data quality is good enough for you, but some companies may need that 100%. So if it's 100%, you will have to profile your data as often as it changes. Okay. And. Um, now, in today's environment where we're dealing with structured and unstructured data and all these many different types of forms um, of data that we have to deal with, um, is uh, data quality and IDQ, is it appropriate for any type of data? It is for most data. I know certain software tools cannot profile unstructured data, you know, or blobs or clouds or things like that. But you know, if possible, I would definitely recommend profiling all the data because really, even if it's unstructured, you could leverage that data as you know, an asset to your company and use it as competitive advantage. It may be more Got difficult, okay. but you should try mm -hmm. to do it. Okay, great. Okay, very good. Um, let's go ahead and uh, close things out. Um, Actually, let me just ask one more question here. Um, if someone has an application that is missing some of the rules, would data quality capture the front-end validation? So if an application does not have the rule? Let me read the question specifically. Okay. We have an application <clears throat> that is missing some of the rules. Would data quality capture the front end validation? Well, it depends on how you actually have it set up, right? So, you know, if you don't have a means of 
indicating that the front end actually validated something, then it won't capture it. So it really depends on how you set up the entire process. Okay. Um, hopefully that answered um, the question. Um, if not, the person that asked, um, if it didn't get your question answered, then, then please um, let us know. Um, we're going to give it a couple more minutes for people to finish entering in their questions. While we're waiting, if we could just scroll to the next slide, we'll announce the next webinar series for people. Okay, coming up in July, July 24th, uh, we will be hosting Len Silverston. Um, he's a, a well-known name um, in the business intelligence and data uh, arenas, very well-known. And the topic of the webinar will be the benefits of leveraging universal data models. So we're very excited to be hosting um, that event coming up in July. And uh, you can just go to our website and um, <clears throat> excuse me, click on the registration there. And so we'd love to have you um, come again. Uh, we really try and make these um, webinars very educational and uh, beneficial for you. So, you know, we appreciate your feedback, and uh, we're so glad that you're, you know, taking some time to spend with us to learn a little bit more about um, some of these um, tips and tricks and tools for the industry. It looks like um, that is it um, as far as the questions, and so let's go ahead and close it out. I'd like to thank Sally McCormick again for um, this very insightful webinar and um, hope to see you all again on July 24th when um, Len um, gives his presentation. Okay, have a great day. Thanks so much.